Good morning, everybody. Are you all there? Can you hear me? Okay. The message I have for you this morning is titled, uh, an interesting title, LNG Why. Why? Because um, many people in the church today, unfortunately, like to just ignore her. Are you with me? There are many people who say, well, and I've heard them all. You can ask whatever it is. Was this part inspired or was that part inspired? I don't accept the compilations. Look, light is light. That's the way I look at it. So I wanted to share with you this complete message. I shared it at uh, Amazing Facts for a devotional, but it was only one segment of it, and I was rifling through all the images. So uh, this is a very complete message. If you want to know, if you want to have these notes, let me know. I'll be more than happy to send them to you. But it is online. It's on Audioverse. It's on YouTube and all those other places. So before we begin, let's bow our heads, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you today that you have come into our presence. Thank you for the word of God which lights our pathway. We thank you for the spirit of prophecy, but we ask that you would um, show those who may have questioned it and convict our hearts of its importance in these last days because Satan would most definitely love to be able to throw this out and there's a reason for that. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we look at the spirit of prophecy, we have uh, two seg segments in the spirit of prophecy. Uh, actually, three segments in this. One of them that I'm going to cover right now is dealing with light and darkness. Then Jesus said to them a little while longer... The light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness doesn't know where he is going. Do you believe that? Do you know why God gave us toes? It's to find furniture in the dark. That is why God gave us toes. How many of you have found furniture with your toes? See? The fool, it talks about the fool here. Wait, let's see. Why is this not advancing? There we go. But he who hates his brothers in darkness and walks in darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes for the commandment is a... Well, what happened here? We jumped. There we go. For the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Many people don't like to hear the spirit of prophecy because it attacks their main core of, okay, where's the switch on this? Oh, it's down at the very bottom. Many don't like it because it attacks who they are, what they believe, it attacks their lifestyle. And many people don't like that. Don't tell me what to do, I'll do what I wanna do. Have you ever heard that before? But is there a light? Is there a rule to life when it comes to this? Yes, there is. And this is what we have to investigate. The dragon was enraged with the woman. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the, what's that word? Testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he uh, for he says, I, he who says I know him and does not keep his commandment is a liar. And the truth is, where? where? Not in him at all. So this binds the testimony and the commandments together at the same time. You see, we find that the prophets of God were his witnesses. They were his spokesmen. And the testimony that they bore was a message of wisdom in life. Isaiah here directs people, men, to the word of God as a standard of truth and the guide to right living. God has revealed himself in his word. This is a very finicky uh, presenter. Now I gotta go back. Wow. 
Okay. I fell on his feet to worship him, and he said, See that you do not do that. I am of your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, this is what John is writing in Revelation, so we find that the spirit of prophecy here was the words that God spoke to men who were his prophets. Does that change anything at all? If God spoke to someone many years ago, would that be not as important today? It's the same. Why? It's still relevant, is it not? Is there, is there an expiration date to the words of God like there is food? No, it doesn't go moldy at all. So we're still good on that. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as a testimony of Christ was conferred in you, confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift. God is giving these words to you so that he's not trying to lead you down a path and then just leave you. He's giving you a complete message to this whole thing eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what we find is we are rich in proportion to the degree in which this gift, the spirit of prophecy gift, is confirmed in our hearts and in our lives. And not only are we not only will those who are settled be sealed in regards to the Sabbath, but they will also be sealed in regards to the testimony. It's not one or the other. It is both in this sense. Will we, have, will we view the testimony as a love letter to his end time people? God doesn't do this to say, look, I'm just trying to pigeonhole you so you can't do anything. God gives this message to us to correct us, to reprove us, to get us on the right path and keep us on that right path all the way to the end. So what we find is the question that comes up is, does the Bible show us how to recognize who a prophet is? If you're taking notes, this is probably a very good section to take notes on in your Bible because this leads us to the 12 biblical tests of a prophet. So you'll want to write these Bible texts down. The first Bible text that we come to is Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or does not come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously and you shall not be afraid of him. In other words, if a prediction a prophet makes doesn't come to pass, he's a what? He's a false prophet. That's pretty straightforward. But sometimes, uh, sometimes things happen where they say, well, it's not really a prophecy because it never happened. If, it, if they say it and it happens, it is a prophecy. Do you remember um, the name Harold Camping? Harold Camping predicted many things. Did they happen? No, not at all. When you stand at the gross, I mean, I don't know now because things are so fast and everybody, you don't stand there and look around all the time. But when you check out at the grocery store, do you remember the Enquirer magazine and all those things, all those predictions they make? Have you seen them come to pass? No, not at all. Okay, maybe this... Okay, I think this is the one I'm supposed to be on. Yeah. Some say, but what about Jonah? He prophesied that Nineveh would be destroyed. He was God's prophet. But was Nineveh destroyed? What was the, what was the reason? Is he... No. So what happened? There was a condition to that, right? Nineveh would be destroyed... He didn't say Nineveh is going to be destroyed. He said Nineveh would be destroyed if they didn't what? Repent. 
I mean, you've got to understand, Jonah walked around Nineveh for, for three, four days. This guy had to have been the best revivalist ever to walk the face of the earth, right? I mean, you have, on the other hand, you have Noah, who's probably the world's worst evangelist, who couldn't save anybody but basically his family. But here, Jonah did an incredible job that the Lord richly blessed as a result of that. Now, there we go. Test number two. Test number two is Numbers 12, 6. Then he said, hear now my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. So what we find is, according to the Bible, a true prophet receives communication from God by two distinct methods, dreams and visions. Just dreams and visions. Test number three, Numbers chapter 24, verse 4 and 16. The utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, and who falls down with eyes wide open. The utterance of him who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. What we find is, therefore, test number three is a divine manifestation that God gives to identify a true prophet that while they're in vision, their eyes remain open. They don't blink at all. Do you remember when Fitch went up to, I think it was, no, it wasn't Fitch, it was another guy. Mrs. White was in vision, and he went up to her with a fist and just basically almost tried to punch her. She did not flinch at all. She didn't blink at all. Her eyes were locked because she was not even conscious that he was even there because she was in communion with God. Test number four, Daniel chapter 10, verse 17. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? For as for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. We find that when Ellen White was in vision, do you remember she was so strong that they took a Bible and they placed it on her, it was a family Bible, about 17 pounds. She stood up, she took that Bible and she held it out. How long did she hold it out for, do you remember? It was 30 minutes she held it out. Now, they have tried that with uh, these muscular guys, Mr. Universe, and they couldn't hold it more than 15 minutes, even if that. She was only about 95 pounds, and she held that Bible out straight. Arm was just like steel. It wasn't unmoving at all. And then you find it says, nor is any breath, well, we'll come to that one. There's another verse for that. Before vision, a prophet might be, whoa, very weak. Sorry, I wish I brought my adapter. Okay, let's try this again. Um, in other words, they don't breathe. According to the scripture, this is one of the miracles God performs to identify a genuine prophet. While in vision, they do not breathe. Daniel chapter 10, verse 18. Then again, one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. Before a vision, we find that a prophet may be very weak physically. And then when taken into vision, a prophet receives supernatural strength as a result of that. Test number six, Jeremiah 29, 28, verse nine. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has sent. In other words, a true prophet does not lie. His predictions will be 100% fulfilled. 99% is not 100%. Do you realize that? Right? I mean, if I, if I put like dog poop in a, a glass, and I ran it through a filter and I said, don't worry, it clears out 99% of it. Are you gonna drink it? There you go. Test number seven, 2 Peter chapter one, verse two. Knowing this first, that no prophecy is of, of scripture is of any private interpretation. We find that a true prophet of the Lord does not give their own spin on the scripture. Every prophecy he or she proclaims will agree with an already established truth. 
If they receive new light, it must already agree with the old light God has given us in the past. Test number eight, Second Peter chapter one, verse 21. For prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. A true prophet prophesies in the name of the Lord, not in their own name. It's not about them at all. A true prophet will manifest the spirits of the same, the fruits of the same spirit, because he or she speaks through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Test number nine, 1 Corinthians 14, three. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. There's a reason for all these because a true prophet's message will cover all these three areas, and that is edification means to instruct morally, exhortation is to strongly advise, comfort is to soothe in distress or to console. All these three exemplify what a true prophet is. Test number 10. If we can get to it. Isaiah 8, 19 and 20. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is lots of light in them, right? There is no light in them at all. A true prophet gives God's true church direction to God's true church. A true prophet will cover all, well, how did we go backwards on this? Come on. To the law, what law? The Ten Commandments and to the testimony, which is the rest of scripture. If they speak not according to this word, which is the Ten Commandments and the Bible, then they speak their own things. It is because they have no light in them. That's to say that a true prophet will keep all of God's Ten Commandments. Listen to that very carefully. If anybody claims today to be a prophet of God and they're a Sunday keeper, that should be a big flag to you. That's not keeping God's Ten Commandments at all. So when you think about that, was Ellen White a Sabbath keeper? Yes, she was. Test number 11. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is already in the world. We find that a true prophet believes in the incarnation of Jesus Christ and that they'll never question the fact that Jesus came in man's fallen nature. The Bible says any person or any church that claims that Jesus Christ came to this earth in any other way than the fallen flesh that you and I have is the spirit of Antichrist. If Jesus didn't have the fallen flesh, how could he be the pathway for us? How could he be our example if he could never have fallen? He could have fallen, but he did not fall. Test number 12, Matthew 7, 15 and 16. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their what? Fruit. Anyone who says, why do, you, why do all these false prophets today insist that you send them money? Have you heard that one? If they're truly of God, they should be happy for those funds to go anywhere in God's work, but no, they tell you that you must send that money. Did you ever see that uh, interview with Kenneth Copeland about this reporter, female reporter, caught him off guard. He was getting into his limo right there in the garage and she questioned him regarding his jet plane that he had to get for $60 million. And, and you watch that interview and you look at his face and you can see the devil in his face right there. It is 
really very interesting. You will know them by their fruits, and this is exactly what God showed Ellen White about false prophets in the last days. You look at the fruits of their ministry. Look at the fruits of the messenger. Are they preaching the truth, or are they lining their own pockets? So you can examine the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You can apply all these 12 tests to any person who has ever lived since the time of John the Revelator, which was around 100 AD. So we've covered two segments right now, the, the light and darkness. We've covered the 12 tests of a prophet. Now we're moving into this aspect, which is really very important. Some of you may not have even heard of this before. It's called the, uh, wow, it's called the time prophecies. Sorry, we're going all over the place. There are eight time prophecies in the Bible. We're going to cover all eight time prophecies, and you will have at the beginning of a time prophecy, you will have what is referred to as a proclaiming prophet. At the end of the time prophecy, you have a gathering prophet, and they do exactly what they're supposed to do. When you compare the two of them, it is imperative to understand the meaning of the name of the prophet, because the name of the prophet, their meaning, corresponds to what their position is proclaiming or gathering. You guys all have a name. Do you know what your name means? How many of you know what your name means? Wow, okay, very few know what your name means. Obviously, if it's a biblical name, you know what that name means. But if your name was a windowsill, do you know what your name means? And probably not. But you see, Bible names were very interesting. They were given because of the meaning of the name. We're going to go through that. At the end of the time prophecy, there is a gathering prophet. That gathering prophet gives a present truth message which is applicable for those living in that particular time period. It is a life or death message that is issued, and it's to gather out the believing remnant people. We'll see that in a moment. Then you have what is called a dispensational or connecting link prophet. Um, Let's say up here on the platform, you can see that there are five sections up here. So this would be like one time prophecy. This would be a second time prophecy. This would be a third time prophecy, but you see the joints in between. A connecting link or dispensational prophet ties from one time prophecy to the other time prophecy. I'll show you that in a little bit more detail coming up here. In the first time prophecy, who do you think the first prophet is of the Lord? Noah. Who? Jesus, did you say? No, you heard this one before, too. Enoch, very good. Enoch is the first, what's his name mean? Teacher. Notice what it said. Enoch was a public teacher of the truth in an age in which he lived. He taught the truth. He lived the truth. He was the character of the teacher who walked with God, and he was in every way harmonious with the greatness and the sacredness of his mission. Enoch was a prophet who spoke as he was moved by the Holy Ghost. He was a light amid the moral darkness. He was a pattern man, a man who walked with God, being obedient to God's law, that law which Satan had refused to obey, which Adam transgressed and Abel obeyed, and because of his obedience, he was what? He was murdered. What did Enoch do? He proclaimed that the flood would come after the death of his son, Methuselah. And what does Methuselah's name means? His name means, when he dies, it shall come. Do you know that the very year Methuselah died was the same year the flood came? So his name, Enoch's son, Methuselah's name and life was a testament that God was waiting for a people to make a change. He was waiting for the ark to get done, which is why Methuselah lives 969 years. The gathering prophet in this is Noah, whose name means rest or to comfort. And 
the, he called his name Noah, saying, this, shall, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands, because the ground which the Lord hath cursed, for 120 years he gives this present truth message while he's building the ark, and that message is, come into the ark, or what? Die in the flood, right? Is there any ands, ifs, or buts about there? Is there any other option, plan B? There isn't a plan B or anything like that. You either enter the ark or you're dying in the flood. And what we find is Noah desi God designed Noah in his life and character that it should present before the antediluvian world a marked example of the results of being, believing the word of God. Notice, he did not walk in the sparks of his own kindling. He obtained all his discernment, all his power, all his strength from the source of all light. For he held communion with God that Noah, sorry, it was because he had faith in God, because he was a man of prayer, that he was a man of power. He kindled his taper at the divine altar that he might be a light to the world. In Noah's day, the inhabitants of the old world laughed to scorn what is termed the superstitious fears and forebodings of this preacher of righteousness. Notice what was said about Noah. He was denounced as an alarmist, right? As a visionary character, a fanatic. And what we find here is that as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the last days. Is that us today? Yeah, absolutely. So just so you understand, people like Harold Camping, all these people who give these false prophecies, they are there for a reason. Satan is using them and God is permitting that for a reason because every time they say, oh, Jesus is coming in 1994, he doesn't come. Jesus is coming in 2012, he doesn't come. By the time we are out there proclaiming the message, trying to give an urgency, because we see the signs that are happening, these people who have been duked several times will say, you know what, we've heard it before. Why, why should we believe you? So that's how Satan is working in the last days. So we find that men will reject the solemn message of warning in our day as they did in Noah's time. They will refer to those false teachers who have predicted the event and set a definite time and will say that they have no more faith in our warnings than in their warnings. Time prophecy number two. Proclaiming prophet is, anybody want to take a guess? Who? Isaiah? No, a little too far. Anybody else? Proclaiming prophet is Abram. His name means exalted father. Later his name was changed to Abraham because he became the father of a great multitude. He proclaims the 400 years of bondage of the Israelites. Notice what is said about Abraham. He was a bright and shining light. His faith, his piety, his devotion were to keep the knowledge of God alive in an age in which he lived. The Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make thy name great and you shall be a blessing. Notice what is said here. Abraham would have greater influence with strangers than with those who were connected with him. He was therefore required to leave his kindred and his, the Lord's promise to him was this, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, and in thee all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We find here that the gathering prophet is Moses. Moses meaning saved out of the water. He was saved from the Nile, he was saved from the Red Sea, and he was saved from the Jordan River. Moses was God's channel of communication to Pharaoh. It was the light that was of heaven that was flashed upon the gross darkness of Egypt, revealing a greater than Pharaoh in the sovereign of the heavens and in the earth, in the great I am. So we find that Israel's marching out of Egypt was a testament that God rules. Now, there's a present truth message that was given to the children of Israel, and that message was this. 
come out of Egypt both literally and spiritually, or what? Or die in the wilderness. Look, just to put it in our day right now, we have been given a warning message to get out of the cities. You've heard that message, right? It's a three-phase message. Get out of the cities preparatory for leaving the country homes for secluded places in the mountains. You heard that. So city, country, home, secluded places in the mountains. But what we find today is this. We leave the cities. What, what's in the cities? Crime, chaos, worldliness, sin. We move to the country. Then we bring all that with us. The same magazines, the same TV shows. Has anything changed? No. So that's why we need to leave Babylon. We need to leave the cities, not just leave them physically, but leave them spiritually as well. Okay. Time prophecy. Oops, third prop. Third time prophecy. The proclaiming prophet is Jeremiah. His name means Yahweh establishes or Yah hurls forth. And what do we find about Jeremiah? He proclaims the 70 years of captivity. In the testimonies of the church, Jeremiah constantly referred to the teachings of the book of the law that had been so greatly honored and exalted during Josiah's reign. He emphasized anew the importance of maintaining a covenant relationship with the all-merciful and compassionate being who had who upon the heights of Sinai had spoken the precepts of the Decalogue, Jeremiah's words of warning and entreaty reached every part of the kingdom and all had opportunity to know the will of God concerning the nation. The prophet made plain the fact that our Heavenly Father allows his judgments to fall, that the nations may know themselves to be but men, Psalms 9.20. If you will walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, the Lord had forewarned his people, saying, I, even I, will scatter you among the heathen, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. The gathering prophet at the end is Daniel. Daniel's name means God is my judge. Judgment is the theme of his book. Now here he's the gathering prophet but you'll find from the succeeding time prophecies that his position changes to the proclaiming prophet at the beginning. So before we get to that, let's cover this one as the gathering. From Daniel and his companions and from Mordecai, a bright and shining light amid the moral darkness of the kingly courts. In holy vision, God reveals to Daniel light and truth that had lain concealed from other men. And through his chosen servants, this light shines down through the ages and will continue to shine through to the end of time. So this is why Daniel switches now from a gathering prophet to a proclaiming prophet because this light of his book continues to shine all the way through the end time. So the present truth message that was given was given to the Jews and that message was this, you need to come out of Babylon or you will die there, and you will be separated from God also and from Israel. Fourth time prophecy. In the fourth time prophecy, the gathering, there is a gathering group of prophets that emerge out of Israel to lead them both literally and spiritually. We know that in Daniel it says, now therefore, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the walls even in troublous times. So this minor prophets that come up, there are several of them. One of them is Zerubbabel. His name means out of Babylon. Haggai, born on a feast day or festive. His concern was restoring the, the national feast. And it says here, thus saith the Lord of hosts saying, this people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Zechariah's name means Yah remembers. 
And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the, what? The idols out of the land, and they shall be no more remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Another prophet that comes up is Ezra. His name means Yah helps. And then we have Nehemiah. Nehemiah felt a burden for the restoration of the walls of Jerusalem, and he prayed. His name means, remember me for good in the judgment, while rendering judgment on those who had taken heathen wives or had given up on the Sabbath. This is kind of where we're at today. Given up on the Sabbath, taken heathen spouses. Those who refused to comply were no longer counted part of Israel. This is kind of a type for the anti-type period that we're living in right now. We find that in giving light to his people anciently, God didn't work through one specific class. Here's the difference we find. Daniel was a prince of Judah. Isaiah was of the royal line. David was a shepherd boy. Amos was a herdsman. Zechariah was a captive of Babylon. And Elisha, a tiller of the soil. He was a farmer. The Lord raised up his representative prophets, the princes, the noble, the lowly, and he taught them these truths that were to be given to the world. This leads us to the fifth time prophecy. Daniel, once again, is the proclaiming prophet. And at the end of that prophecy, we find the gathering prophet comes up at the end of the 483 years. And what do we know about this particular gathering prophet? His name is John the Baptist. John is a shortened form of the Hebrew word Yohanna, meaning Yah is exalted. Yah is gracious. This is what is said of John. There is another that bears witness of me, and I know that witness which he witness of me is true. You sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not the testimony from men, but these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works which John hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. We find it that this particular fifth time prophecy, the gathering out remnant, was John's disciples who believed his stirring message of repentance from sin or separation from God's people. This leads us to the sixth time prophecy. In the sixth time prophecy, just to make sure you're listening, who's the proclaiming prophet? It's just Daniel. But hitting all three, that's pretty safe. But it's just Daniel. Daniel once again, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation, and that determined he shall be poured out upon the desolate. That's from John 9.27. We find here that for the first half of the seven of the 490 years up into the cross of 34 AD, we have the fulfillment of the prophecy of the arrival of Jesus, whose name means Yah's salvation, as the anointed one, the Messiah. At the end of this, you have the gathering prophet. This is another John, a different John. You have the apostle John, known as John the Revelator, because he revealed Christ, having touched him, having heard him, and having seen him. The believing remnant were the disciples who accepted the present truth message of the cross. They were no longer Jews. They were what? Christians at that point. Wow. I don't know what happened there. I can't go that far forward. Can you back up at all to the seventh time prophecy? Can you find it? 
It's probably 15 slides behind. If you know the number, it's slide 115. There, there we go. Present truth, the message of the cross. Okay, so now that brings us to time prophecy number seven. The proclaiming prophet is, Daniel once again, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the Holy One. During this time period, you have the stoning of Stephen at the end of the 490 years and the final seven years of Daniel's particular prophecy. At the end of that, then you have the gathering prophet that Paul pops up and his name is Saul. But Saul's name is changed from asked for or chosen and his name is later changed to Paul, which in Latin means small or least of all the disciples. This is what is said of Paul. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way for he is a chosen vessel unto me. Do you remember who said those words? God said those words to who? To Peter? No, he said it to Ananias. Because he told Ananias, go lay hands on him that he might have his sight again. And so Ananias was not so sure about this whole thing because Paul was coming to kill all the Christians. So this is what God said to him. He's a chosen vessel of mine. He's to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. We find at the end, the gathering believing remnant were both the Jews and the Gentiles who accepted the present truth message to come out of Judaism to Christianity or they would be separated from God's people. Now, this leads us to the last time prophecy. This is the one that you need to really pay attention to. So if you're sleeping, this is the time that you need to really wake up. This is the message to the Laodiceans. Daniel is the proclaiming prophet, and he proclaims here, Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Prior to the end of the 2,300 days, each of the prophets had one name. And we know that at the end of the 2,300 days mark the beginning of this pre-advent judgment, or the anti-typical day of atonement, or the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary just so that we're clear on this. Daniel 8.14 brings us to the year 1844. In October 22, 1844, Christ entered from the holy to the most holy place. During that transition, he is in the most holy place. Where is he now? He's still in the most holy place. What is he doing? He's doing the work of atonement. He's doing the, the investigative judgment. He's weighing out our lives to see whether, how we weigh out in the balances. When he steps out of the most holy place, where is he coming? He's coming here. Do you understand how serious a time period this is? This is, this is not a time to be sleeping in the church. If you're gonna be in church, this is a time that you really need to wake up and understand what's going on. But this particular message here is a very critical message because on August 20, November 26, 1827, this prophet comes up and she was born in the sixth church of Revelation. Which church is that? Do you remember? The sixth church. Church is Philadelphia. Notice her name very carefully here. You have Ellen Gould Harmon. Harmon is the name for Harmony is a short form for that. Church of Brotherly Love is the Church of Harmony. Now notice what happens here. She was born in this pre-Philadelphia church name and she was given her first vision in 1844 in December, two months after the, the great disappointment that happened. Now what we find that's interesting is two years after that, she marries James Springer White. Her name now gets changed 
to Ellen Gould White. Drop the Harmon, add the White. And this is what's very interesting that you need to understand. When we look at the problems of the Laodicean church, we find that in Revelation chapter 317, this lays out the problems that every one of us is facing today. The Bible says here, because you say that you're rich, you're increased with goods, and you have need of nothing, and you really don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But the remedy is given to us in the next verse, in verse 18. It says here, I counsel of you to buy of me what? Gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and white raiment, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So in this particular verse, the remedy given to the Laodicean church has three things that you need to have. It's the gold, the white raiment, and the eye salve. What are those exactly? Well, Mrs. White says the gold is the purification of your character. The white raiment is the righteousness of Christ. The eye salve is the ability to see the wiles of Satan and shun them, to detect sin and abhor it, to hear truth and obey it. This is what is so cool. You look at her name, Ellen Gould Harmon. Ellen is the old Greek word for light. Gould is the old British word for gold. And white is the white raiment of purity. So in her name alone, you have all those three things that we need. What we are told is, will you heed the counsel of the true witness to seek the gold tried in the fire, the white raiment, and the eye salve? I already explained what those pieces were to you. And we find that the gathering out believing remnant in this eighth time prophecy is the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the present truth, life or death message that is given to the church is this, and that is come out of Babylon spiritually into the Sabbath-keeping church, or be what? Separated from God's people. That is a pretty clear message. But it is also important for us to be able to understand, if I can get to the next slide, that a few of these prophets were also referred to as what we call that dispensational or connecting link prophets. They are important because what they do is they change the focus of worship. Here's what I'm going to show you. The prophet John was the connecting link between two dispensations. As God's representative, he stood forth to show the relation of the law and the prophets to the Christian dispensation. He was a lesser light, which was followed by a greater light. But we find that the mind of John was illuminated by the Holy Spirit, that he might shed light upon his people, but no other light ever shone as bright upon fallen men as that which emanated from the teachings and example of Jesus. Said Christ in vindication of John, what did you come out here to see? A prophet? I say this to you. Not only was John a prophet to foretell future events, but he was a child of promise, filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth, and was ordained of God to execute a special work as a reformer. In preparing a people for the reception of Christ, the prophet John was the connecting link between two dispensations. Let me put it in practical terminology to you. So we find that when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, when did they worship God? Whenever God walked there into the garden with them, they worshiped God. But the moment they left the Garden of Eden, where did they go? It says here, Adam and Eve, the worship of God was conducted on altars placed before the gate of the Garden of Eden, where the cherub with a flaming sword stood. The Garden of Eden remained on earth long after man had become an outcast from its pleasant paths. The fallen race were permitted to gaze upon the home of innocence, their entrance barred only by the watching angel. At the cherub guarded gate of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. Here came Adam and his sons to worship God. Here they renewed their vows of obedience to the law 
the transgression of which had banished them from Eden. So they only came right there to the gate, the opening to the Garden of Eden. But then the flood came. What happened after the flood came? Where did they go to worship God? Well, this is where we have to understand here. Noah was a prophet who changed as it were the focus of worship from the gate of Eden to wherever man made altars to God. From altars, Moses changed it as it were the focus of worship to the tabernacle and later the temple where the fiery presence of God was manifested in the holy Shekinah that resided. From the temple, John the Baptist changed the focus of worship to Jesus in the holy place of the heavenly temple and the change was manifested by the fiery descent of the Holy Spirit. Now, in our day, from Jesus as our priest in the holy place, giving, receiving our confessions, confessed sins from us, Ellen G. White served as a dispensational or connecting link prophet who changed, as it were, the focus of God's worshipers to Jesus in the most holy place, who is serving as our high priest officiating on the Day of Atonement in preparation for the close of probation and the final placement of all confessed sins onto Satan, the originator of sin, as typified by the scapegoat. You see where this is going? God is trying to lead a people he has chosen, a church on earth whom he has made depositories of his law. He has committed to them sacred trust and eternal truth to be given to the world. This is why he would reprove them, he would correct them. So the message to the Laodicean church or the Seventh-day Adventists, because we have, we've had great light, but we have not walked in that light. It is those who have made great profession but have not kept in step with their leader that will be spewed out of his mouth unless they repent. Look, when you hear truth, how long should that truth linger in your eardrums before you actually obey it? Can you, can you mull over it for a, a couple decades? I mean, if, you're, if you've been an Adventist for decades and you haven't changed anything in your character, if you haven't changed anything in your health, in your diet, in your eating, in your spending, in your looking, in your hearing, then why are you an Adventist? Why do you take the time to come to church? I would say at that point, just don't bother coming to church. Go out into the world. Because if, if you're going to come to church, but you're not going, you're going to hear the truth, but it's not going to do anything for you, then why? The moment you hear truth, you have to obey it, because if you don't obey it, what happens? Satan will discount that, he will make other things happen, and all of a sudden, all these precious truths are no longer important because Satan is diminishing them to a point that he's trying to make it invalid. We find that the message to pronounce the Seventh-day Adventist Church Babylon and call the people of God out from her doesn't come from any heavenly messenger or any human agent inspired by the Spirit of God. There are many ministries out there that you will find on YouTube that call the Bride of Christ, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Babylon. Have you heard it? Be very aware of these ministries. Don't listen to them. That is not of God. That is the spirit of Antichrist that's there. So you need to be very careful of these ministries out there. Some who, re are, who are not willing to receive the light but prefer to walk in the ways of their own choosing, will search the testimonies to find something in them to encourage the spirit of disobedience and unbelief. There are plenty of anti-Adventist websites out there. There are plenty of anti-Ellen White websites out there. Who are these people? These are our former brethren. And we've been told and we've been warned that our former brethren will be our most hated enemies. That is coming to fruition in these last days because a spirit of disunion will be brought in for the spirit which leads them to criticize the testimonies will also lead them to watch their brethren to find in them something to condemn. 
This is Satan's game plan, to constantly press the superiors, to lead away from the truth. Notice the quote, the very last deception of Satan is to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God, because where there is no vision, the people will perish. And Satan will work ingeniously in different ways through different agencies to unsettle the confidence in God's remnant people in the true testimony. This is his game plan. It is Satan's special objective to prevent this light from coming to the people of God who so greatly need it amid the perils of the last days. And we will find that very soon every possible effort will be made to discount and pervert the truth of the testimonies of God's Spirit. This is why we must have in readiness the clear straight messages that have been coming since 1846 to God's people. We find that there will be those who were once united with us in the faith who will search for new strange doctrines or something odd and sensational to present to the people. They will bring all these conceivable fallacies and will present them as coming from Mrs. White that they may beguile souls. You've heard the anti-Trinitarian movement because many of them say we are going back to what the pioneers believed. Would you like to go back to when you were about five or six years old, when you didn't know anything? That's exactly what they're going to. They're going back to the pioneers who didn't have all the light. They didn't walk in all that light. They didn't understand the full truth. How could they believe the Holy Spirit then? But we have the full truth now. So to go back is a very dangerous thing for God's people in these last days. As the end draws near and the work of giving the last warning message to the world extends, it becomes more important for those who accept present truth to have a clear understanding of the nature and the, test and the influence of the testimonies which God in his providence has linked with the work of the third angel's message from its very rise. And it's not only those who openly reject the testimonies or who cherish doubts concerning them that are on dangerous ground. To disregard the light is to reject it. In other words, when you hear the truth, that is light given to us, you disregard it, you ignore it, you are actually rejecting it because it is the Spirit of God that is trying to lead you to all truths. Some of you in words acknowledge reproof, but in heart you do not accept it. You go on the same before, only being less susceptible to the influence of the Spirit of God, becoming more and more blinded, having less wisdom, less self-control, less moral power, less zeal and relish for religious exercises, and unless converted, you will finally, it chopped it off, yield your hold upon God entirely. You have not made decided changes in your life when reproof has come, because you have not seen and realized your defects in character and the great contrast between your life and the life of Christ. What do your prayers amount to when you disregard, uh, what do you, when you regard iniquity in your hearts? Unless you make a thorough change, you will not far hence become weary of reproof as the children of Israel did, and like them, you will apostatize from God. We can't take that attitude because if we take that attitude it's a very dangerous attitude because some of us we actually sit in judgment on the scriptures declaring that this or that passage is not inspired because it doesn't strike their minds favorably. They cannot harmonize it with what they call philosophy and science falsely so called. Others for different reasons question portions of the Word of God so, as a result, Satan walks around preparing the way for them. Now, it is not in the providence of man to pronounce sentence upon the scriptures or to judge or condemn any portions of God's word. When one presumes to do this, Satan will create an atmosphere for him to breathe which will dwarf spiritual growth. Here's the warning. When a man feels so very wise that he dares to dissect God's words, his wisdom is, with God, counted foolishness. 
Many are going contrary to the light which God has given his people because they don't read the books which contain the light. Here's the problem I have, and this is what's very scary to me. When I sit in a church <coughs> as a pastor and as a speaker, not just preaching on a Sabbath, but preaching many times during the year, it takes a lot to feed me. But when I hear a preacher go up there and they start talking about all these different religious books that they've read, I get really insecure. I get very scared of these people because they'll throw out one or two scriptures. They're totally void of the spirit of prophecy, but they will quote all these other speakers out there, Max Lucado, Philip Yancey, whoever that may be. Look, here's a saying. This is a saying I stole from W.D. for Z. He says, Babylon does not know the way to the Most High God. And the priests of Babylon cannot tell you about the road in which they have never traveled. What can a Sunday church writer, author, preacher tell you about the sanctuary that the spirit of prophecy in the Bible do not already tell you? But the problem for us today is that we don't want to read those things. We would rather read these other things. So we find here, as a result of it says, because they do not read the books which contain the light and knowledge in cautions, reproofs, and warnings. The cares of the world, the love of fashion, the lack of religion have turned the attention of light, which has so graciously been given to us that while books and periodicals containing error are traveling all over the country. Skepticism and infidelity are increasing everywhere. Light so precious coming from the throne of God is hid under a bushel. I will say this to you, that when, I, this sounds horrible, but when I get the Adventist periodicals and I get them in the mail, I don't take them into my house. I just continue walking and putting them in a big dumpster outside. Because there's no truth in some of those things. Yes, there's probably a little bit here, but I, I hate to say it, I grew up in public school. And I'm very appreciative that I grew up in public school, even though I was an Adventist. Because in public school, I had to know what I believed in order to be a witness to people. When you go to the Adventist school, you can just sit there and ride the train and you don't have to say anything to anybody because everybody's supposed to believe what you believe. Does that make sense? So when we read the Adventist periodicals, we think this is truth. But so many people get disillusioned as a result of this. This is why you have to be very careful. You have to know what you believe, but you will not know what you believe if you're not studying to know what you believe. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Okay, another thing that comes here is this last part, it says, light so precious coming from the throne of God is hid under a bushel. Do you remember that illustration that was given in the Sermon on the Mount? I think it was Matthew chapter six, or they said a city that is on, set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and place it in the house and they cover it with a bushel but they uncover it so that it gives light to the whole house. Remember, back then the houses were very small. They weren't like 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 square footage like we have today. You had a small house. You had a table in there. You had a candle up there. One candle was enough to light the whole house. But what they would do in Jesus' illustration here, they take the bushel and they cover it. What's a bushel? It's a basket. What was a basket used for in Bible times? It was a means of commerce. You go out and you buy a, a bushel of fruit, a bushel of vegetables, a basket of this or a basket of that. It was a means of commerce, of retail. Do you see what's going on? Put the math together. What people did, and it's the same today, they take the light of God and they're too afraid and too scared or they don't want to watch it or they don't want to listen to it or they don't want to read it because they would prefer to make money and so they cover the light of truth with the bushel basket today. 
I'm too busy working. I don't have time for a prayer meeting. I'm too busy that I'm trying to make money. I'm trying to make ends meet. I'm trying to get a new car. I'm... Who says you have to buy a new car? Who says you have to live in a mansion? Who says you have to wear all these designer clothes? You see, we take the, the word of God, the truth, in its most simplistic form, and we cover it so that we can make money. And we'll deal with God later when we get there. But later sometimes never comes for God's people. You see, the Lord has sent his people much instruction, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Now, I've heard many people say this, and they say it in ignorance. So let me clarify the air. You have the Bible, and then you have the spirit of prophecy. They say that the Bible is the greater light, and the spirit of prophecy is the lesser light. So we need to read the, the greater light, and the lesser light is really not as important. This is the clarification from this. The greater light is in the Bible. It's not the Bible itself. It is Jesus that is in the Bible. He is the greatest light that has ever shone in this world. Now, let me ex give you an example. As I speak to you today, you are all hearing my voice from Jim in the back to you up here, to my wife over there, to Noah sitting in the back. All of you are hearing my voice, but you are in different sections. God spoke to man. He spoke to Moses. He spoke to David. He spoke to Paul. He spoke to Daniel. He spoke to Ellen White. It's the same inspiration that is given. It's on the same plateau. Do you understand? The sacredness that was given to the Bible writers is the same words that was given to Ellen White. Yes, we believe sola scriptura, but the spirit of prophecy is on the same level as the Bible. She is the same equal with Paul, with Moses, and with Joseph. But the greater light is not them. The greater light is Jesus. And through Jesus lights everything else. Does that make sense? So we find that the greater light is to lead men and women to the lesser light, which is all those other things. Once you're drawn to Jesus, you're drawn to the rest of the writings of the scriptures, and you're drawn to the spirit of prophecy as well with that. We find that the books containing this light were read with a determination to carry out the principles they contain. There would be a thousandfold greater vigilance, a thousandfold more self-denial and resolute effort, and many more would be rejoicing in the light of present truth. So we find this. The spirit of prophecy does two things for us. It shows Satan unmasked, and it reveals God to us. In early writings, we find this quote, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen was shown it would be caused by the straight testimony called for by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodicean. Some will not bear this straight testimony, they will rise up against it, and this is what will cause the shaking among God's people. Are you seeing that today? Absolutely. Did I cut that short? Yeah, that's the rest of the quote there. So the question is, what causes the shaking among God's people? It's the straight testimony. Because it, it hits a nerve. You ever hit your funny bone? You ever hit something like an elbow? It's like, wow! That's what it does. It strikes a nerve, and they don't like it. And as a result, it's saying, which testimony is that? It's a testimony called for by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodicean. The Laodicean is blind, is naked, is wretched, is miserable. And when you try to tell them that, they think they become wise in their own eyes. And what's the reaction of them? They rise up against it. They hate it. They don't want to hear it as a result of that. And we're told that this is what causes the shaking among God's people. One thing is certain. Those Seventh-day Adventists who take up their stand under Satan's banner will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs 
contained in the testimonies of God's Spirit. And we find in ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of the prophets. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his Spirit. And we find that there was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. So you see, Ellen White is not just a minor prophet, no minor prophet, but she's on par with all the greats that are out there. But remember, this is Satan's last deception. Where there is no vision, the people will perish. And Satan is working ingeniously in different ways through different agencies to unsettle the confidence in God's remnant people in the true church. Paul Harvey, he said many years ago, 25 years ago, men and women, women have been honored on American postage stamps for more than 100 years, starting with one woman who was not an American, Queen Isabella in 1893. Since then, 86 women have been honored, ranging from Martha Washington, Marilyn Monroe, Louis, Louisa May Alcott, Emily Dickinson. Then he says, but I can name an American author who has never been honored thus. Though her writings have been translated into 148 languages, more than Marx or Tolstoy, more than Agatha Christie, more than William Shakespeare, only now is the world coming to appreciate the recommended prescriptions for optimal spiritual and physical health, Ellen White, and in Paul Harvey's way of doing it. You don't know her, get to know her. The Bible tells us, believe his prophets and you shall, shall prosper. The thing that I find very interesting, the Bible was written without any capitalization, without any punctuation whatsoever. There was no versing, there was no chaptering at all. It was just one block, 48 lines on the page, that was it. But notice, believe his prophets and you shall prosper and you will have perfect vision in 2020. That's not coincidence. You wanna find another interesting one? You all know John 3:16. John also wrote three other books, first, second, and third John. Look up 1 John 3.16 sometime. Same chapter, same versing, and you'll find a very similar verse to that as well. I pray that this message may be one that would awaken your eyes and give you a better appreciation for the spirit of prophecy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to you, we give you thanks because you have given us light. Help us not to hide it under a bushel. Help us to read it with a determination to follow it. And Lord, when we try to follow it, when we read it and we struggle, we stumble, we ask that you would help us, pick us up, wipe us off, and give us a fervor to be obedient to your words. Be with each and every one who heard this message. Guide and direct them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.